Well, it was the spring of 1868 in the Swiss Alps. Due to the uh, melting snow from the winter and then the rains in the springtime, they had a lot of floods. And so the uh, Swiss government called on all the people to do two things, donate stuff and also come and help because they had a lot of people in need. In fact, they adopted a motto for that appeal, and it was this, one for all and all for one. You may have heard that before, right? But that motto was not original with them because in, 19, in 1844, Alexander uh, Dumas wrote a book that you may have heard of. It's a novel called The Three Musketeers. And it was the motto of those three musketeers. You know, they were named after the rifles that they carried. That was their motto because they knew this. We need to stick loyal to one another through thick and thin. And so that, their, you know, their motto is remembered longer than their muskets are remembered. We have to stick together through thick and thin. You remind me of the three musketeers. If you look around, you'll see a group of people who've stuck together through thick and thin, haven't you? Amen. And you're wondering why I have these, right? Well, you just have to wait for that. In a little while, I'll let you know. But sticking together through thick and thin is uh, the is re the title is one for all and all for one. And uh, Paul wrote from prison. In fact, he said, "Remember my chains." And uh, one of the, he wrote four books from prison, that Roman prison. But one of them we're going to look at here in just a minute. In fact, if you can go ahead, DJ, and put that next slide up there. This is a chapter out of one of those books that he wrote while he was wearing the equivalent of handcuffs. And by the way, did you, do you guys know what the word for handcuffs is in Spanish? Esposas. De veras. <laughs> no es una mentira. They're called wives. Don't blame me. I'm just the bearer. I didn't make that up. <laughs> but in Ephesians 4, Paul made an appeal to that church that he was very close to. He had spent three years with them. He, he was, in fact, their church planter, and he had left his friends Aquila and Priscilla to co-pastor that church while he went on subsequent mission trips. And then another time, he, he made a stop by just to meet with the leadership to encourage them. But this is a book that he wrote literally from that prison in Rome. And we're going to read from it. If you'll look in your Bibles in Ephesians chapter 4, we're going to look at some of that together. Some of you may, may be able to see it up here on the, this as well. You know what? It's interesting to me that uh, when we... You know, I create these PowerPoints on one program, but then we translate it to another one, and it messes it all up. But, uh, yeah, that's not at all how I had it on the deal. That's not the first time that's happened, though, is it? And we'll I'll stick together through thick and thin, and I think it'll, it'll work out anyway. But uh, if you'll go ahead and look in your Bibles, Ephesians chapter 4, we're going to read from this passage. But it's interesting the way the... The, the structure of the section that we will read, Paul chases a rabbit right in the middle of it. He, he makes kind of an excursion and makes some other points. And, but those points are still relevant. But I'm going to treat them separately. And I think you'll catch up why. So actually what we're going to do is read the middle section of this passage together first. And then we'll read the, uh, the sec section that precedes that middle and then succeeds it. But uh, I guess I'd like to start... Um, you know, my print is so small here. It's, uh, yeah, in, on verse 8 right there. This is the rabbit that he chased in the middle of this appeal for unity. And he said this. Say again? Yeah, that's, uh, that looks good. Yeah, let's do that. And you can read that. I'll read it from my sheet, okay? Paul said this from prison. When he, who do you think he's talking about? He's talking about Jesus. When he ascended, you know, went back on high, he took many captives. That's a little phrase that would, you know, we're not we're going to kind of just pass over that this morning. It's another subject. But he took captives and, this is the part we're going to talk about, he gave gifts. He gave gifts to, pe to his people. Now what does he ascended mean? Except that he also 
descended to the lower earthly regions. He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens. In order, and this is a phrase that caught my attention this week, to fill the whole universe. You know, when I think about Jesus ascending, the, the, my mind's picture is like a light, you know, that was at the ascension after he gave the Great Commissions in Matthew 28. And then he says that, you know, he ascended. He went up to the heavens. And, and I guess I picture it like, you know, used to, we used to watch the space shuttles take off. And the higher they get, the smaller they get. And they get tiny and tinier and tinier. Finally, they get so small that you can't see them. That's what in my mind's eye until this week I had pictured what it must have looked like when Jesus ascended. But this passage corrected my misperception. Here's what happened when he, as he ascended. He didn't get smaller and smaller. He filled the whole universe. Just imagine that, looking up at the sky. In fact, I have a slide for you. Let's look at that next slide. Oh, you may have skipped through. Let's see what comes up, DJ. There you go. Just think, looking up at the sky... And imagining Jesus filling the whole sky. Not ascending into a little speck, but filling it all. Now, I did not take this picture, but I saw a sight very similar to this picture this week. Kelly, as you know, uh, Kelly and I went up to Colorado for a little vacation. And Thursday night a week ago, we were dry, on our way up there. We left in the afternoon. And, and so it was good and dark. Uh, we were driving between uh, Pecos and Carlsbad. And it was a, a moonless night, a cloudless night, and big stars. And so we were driving along, and I said, you know, we've got many miles to go, but you know what, Let's, here's a road. We exited the highway, and we drove down this little, you know, dusty oil field road until we got far enough that the car lights from the highway wouldn't cause a problem. And we stopped, turned off the truck, and got out. And, and we leaned back against the truck, and I put my head back on the hood of the truck so I could look straight up. And I saw a sight, not quite, but pretty similar to that right there. And it was just gorgeous. The Milky Way was so prominent. And I was already working on this message, and I thought of that. Jesus fills all of that. And so that impressed me, as you can tell it left an impression on me. And then as we, you know, then we got in the truck, went the rest of the way, and well, I actually spent the night in, uh, uh, what's that little town where they had the aliens? Roswell. And then the next day, drove the rest of the way to Colorado. But uh, this took, took us by surprise. We just planned the trip when it would fit in our schedule. But what the surprise was is we, we were in Colorado just right for the, for the fall foliage. And I hadn't even thought about that. And so, let's see. Let's go through a few of those pictures. What's a vacation without pictures, right? DJ, let's see. There we are. And you know, you may have thought that uh, my esposa may have been a, uh, uh, an imaginary friend because she can't come on Sundays. But that is Kelly right there. And uh, you can see in the background there, of course, never does the picture do reality justice. But uh, you can see a bunch of colors back there. And go to the next slide. What we enjoy doing much of our time is driving some of those little roads that go through the national parks where you can get close and personal with all those trees and colors. And that's what it looked like. Going to the next slide. And uh, isn't that pretty? We, we, but the whole time I was thinking, Jesus fills all of this. He is occupying all the universe. The next slide is the last one of our vacation pictures, but it shows, you know, the variety of colors you can see there. And again, picture doesn't do it justice, but there were reds and oranges and yellows and, of course, the greens. If you look to the top left, that's a mountain with snow on top of it. And then in this picture, it's a little cloudy, but other pictures we took, you know, the sky was just brilliantly blue. And I got to thinking, look at all the variety. You know, you've got the brown road, and then you've got the green leaves and the, the evergreen still, and then you have the yellow and the, the orange and the reds, and then you have the white and the snow and the clouds and the blue in the sky. And guess what? All of those colors were not competing with one another. They were all complementing one another.
And the yellows weren't saying, we're the best. And the blue sky wouldn't say, no, we're bigger than you are. We're better than you. And, and even, you know, the green, the evergreens weren't saying, no, 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 look at us instead. You know, it, they all complimented this beautiful picture that was reminding me that God, that Jesus occupies all of it. They weren't competing. They were complimenting. And so that even in the picture, even in this little rabbit chase that Paul takes in this passage, it still speaks of unity and variety and unity and diversity. Okay, let's go on to the next slide and let's read the rest of this passage. And it does address, address exactly what we are as a church. And then he goes on to follow. In chapter 5, he talks about how unity applies to us as families. And then uh, even as parents, the way we treat our children. That's the sequence that he takes. And uh, this isn't going to really, uh, we'll see how it shows up there. But the, the safer bet is to look in Ephesians chapter 4. And we'll begin reading at verse 4. And this is Paul's call to this church that he cared about very much. A call to unity. As a prisoner, there he is, again, reminding us. As a prisoner of the Lord, then I urge you to live life in a worthy manner of the calling that you have received. Be completely humble. We talked about that a few weeks ago, didn't we? Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient. Bearing with one another in love, of course. Make every effort. You know, even in our families, it requires effort, doesn't it? Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit. He's going to talk about the source of it in just a second. Through the bond of peace. Because, here he goes, this is the source of that unity. There is one body and one Spirit. Just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith. One baptism. One God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned. And so then he goes into the passage about Jesus having descended, then ascending, and in doing so, giving gifts. This is a redundant theme in the New Testament. The gifts that are given to us as God's children. And in, in each of those passages, we're going to reference them here in just a minute. When he talks about the gifts of the Spirit, he talks about unity of the Spirit. That gifted and that unity coming together. You know, like three musketeers sticking together through thick and thin. Okay. The passage goes on. Move down to verse 11. Catch up with me. So Christ himself gave. There's the gifts. And these are some of the kinds of gifts that he gave to the people. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, the pastors and teachers, different kinds of gifting to equip the people for the works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. Until we all reach the unity, there's that word again, in the faith, and in the knowledge of the Son of God, and become mature. Attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Gifted. And we embody together the fullness of Christ. So not only when he ascended did he fill all the heavens, he filled all of us. And so when we look around in this room, we see people gifted as he ascended. Gifted people, and then called together in union. Verse 14, then we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves. How are we not tossed back and forth? We have each other to keep each other in line. Not tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature Body. That's the other metaphor of us, isn't it? A body. We're to look at some more of him who is the head. That is Christ. So how can we be so diverse and yet unified? He's the head. And we are his 
body. And the head thinks for and hopes for and gives direction to the body. And then that brings us together. Yeah. From him, the whole body joined together, held together by every supporting ligament. It grows and builds itself up in love as each person does his work. Isn't that a good picture? You know, gifted differently, on purpose by God. And yet, in our, in our differences, still united by him because he's our boss. And he's the one in charge. And, you know, the church is seen as the body of Christ. And he is the head. And so that's the source of our unity. Not that we will all have the same ideas. No, we don't. On purpose. Who was it that said, if you and I have the same ideas, then one of us is not necessary. You know, it's, it's, it's really important that we voice our different ideas and preferences. And, and, uh, and, and even, you know, the different kind of music that we may like. Uh, but that we all come together recognizing that. He's the one that's really in charge. And it's not my opinion. We're not in competition with one another. We complement one another. That's the difference between a solo and a symphony, isn't it? They're complementing one another. Nobody's competing. So here we are, uh, the body of Christ. And, like I said, this is a redundant theme throughout Scripture. Is not the only pay, place. He's calling us to live this a, a life that's worthy of the gifts that we've been given. Because we're not in competition with one another either. And so the Bible teaches one for all and all for one. And I came up with a picture that you've seen something similar to this before. Go ahead and show that next slide if you would, DJ. Isn't that what we look like? Look at the variety that's expressed in that. And, and yet we're all united together. Yesterday in college football, you know, those teammates all gathered together and they did that, didn't they? All right, we're all one for all and all for one. And they worked together. Uh, Chris, uh, I mean, uh, uh, Sean, did you enjoy that game yesterday afternoon? Yeah, if any of you heard or saw the Aggie game, it was quite the deal. But uh, I digress. Uh, let's see. Uh, one for all. And all for one. And even those games, that game was a picture of that. Because you had different players who made doofus moves. And you had other players who made amazing moves. And then as a team, together, you know, they were able to beat Tennessee. Yeah. Because they were working. They weren't com competing with one another they were complimenting one another. Okay, here's some of those other passages of Scripture. You've heard these before. Romans chapter 12. Again, the same Paul talking about gifts. And it's a little different list in, in uh, Romans 12. And 1 Corinthians 12, it's a little different list. But the point is the same every single time. We're gifted in diverse ways. Diverse on purpose. Gifted differently. Yet, for one purpose... And in each of those appeals to exercise our gifts is an appeal to do so in unity, to do so together. Yeah. The very last prayer that Jesus had with his disciples, we referenced it a few weeks ago. Um, it's in John chapter 17 is where that's recorded. And there was a word that Jesus used over and over and over again in that passage. He was praying for the disciples. And he even says in that very same passage, I know no longer, speaking to the Father, I not only pray for them, but those who will follow them. That's us in this room. And you know what that word was that he prayed over and over and over and over and over again for us? One. That they would be one. Unified. And so that's the theme throughout all of these different passages of Scripture. Diversely gifted but called together in unity to be one. Isn't it cool when it works out that way? Don't you love it? What greater delight for a parent than to see his or her children playing together and loving one another. Isn't that as good as it gets? And as the Father looks to us as his body, what delight that he takes in seeing us playing together and being unified. 
And many of you, I, 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 I'm, I'm telling the truth, you are an example of this for me. You have stuck together through thick and thin. And it's because of Jesus' call on your lives that you've remained together as one great example. We're going to finish with this. I've asked for some help. So Isaac, if you would bring your esposas with you. And Tom, you go on here, come up here too, because I don't know how to operate these things. Jesse, come on and help me. And uh, George, you're up, man. Come help me. What we're going to do is see an example of Ephesians chapter 4. And I've asked for all this, these people, diversely gifted. <laughs> we represent a little bit of diversity here on the stage, do we not? But uh, in our appearance, but also in our giftedness. Here's what I want you to do. Handcuff me to George. I can do that. All right. I don't know how that works. I want you to know that that's the very first time I've ever been <laughs> handcuffed. It won't be the last. It won't be the last. Okay. All right. Done by an expert. All right. Uh, George, we better get along now, hadn't we? Okay. Okay. All right, Jesse. Uh, Isaac, now I've been handcuffed twice right here in front of you. Never before happened. Okay, here we are. All right, Jesse, we got to get along now, don't we? Yeah, we're stuck. You know, here we are, and look at the diversity. You know, you can tell that, uh, you know, we are all gifted, but gifted very differently. But now guess what? We're connected. You know what? All right, let's think of it. What if a fire broke out in this building? It wouldn't be the first time. It's happened twice before. If a fire breaks out in this building, okay, what if George says, hey, that's the fastest way out? And I go, no, huh? I like that door over there. And Jesse says, you are crazy. I like that door. It's the best one out. What if we stand here fussing about what's going to happen? We're going to burn up. That's right. We'll burn up. But guess what? It's in my best interest, one for all, and all for one, to say, I think we need to come to an agreement. Okay. <laughs> now, if we didn't, George would probably just head for that door and drag the rest of us with him, right? <laughs> and so here we are. Here's a picture that was prompted by a man who, who wrote a letter from prison in chains. But behind the scenes of that, the very words that he wrote, here's a picture of unity. And so we owe one another a terrible loyalty. You've heard me say before, uh, G.K. Chesterton said it, because we're all in a leaky boat on a stormy sea. And so that we would depend on each other's giftedness. And you know, take into account the preferences and the opinions and the cares of each other because we're stuck in this thing together, guys. We don't have a way out unless these guys can come up with a key. <laughs> I think Tomas has a key for us here. Do all keys fit all esposas? Yes. Oh, really? All right. Well, let's, uh, let's un unhitch. Connect, unhitch. Yeah, that's a, the right word for that. Yeah, don't lose the key. But, uh, you know... Uh, is, is that a picture that we can all keep in mind as we, you know, we'll have differences of opinions along the way, won't we? Yes. You know, as we are prayerfully, is your clock going off every night at 10.02? Mine is. Bing! It goes off. And so I'm reminded to pray for us as we wait for God for our, our next pastor. But as we, you know, discuss and read resumes and pray about it, you know, along the way, the preferences of one and the preferences of another may not always be the same. But guys, you know what? We are all in this thing together. Yes, we are. We're one for all and all for one because he has brought us together, right? Amen. Cool. I kind of like sharing the stage with you guys. <laughs> I appreciate all of you doing this. Stay here. Let me pray for us. And then we're going to have our invitation time. So, uh, worship team, if you would go ahead and come this way. Let's do so. Lord, we, we're not just trying to play lightly about something that is very, very serious to you. If it were your last prayer for the 12 and then for us, that they would be one, 
that we would be one, then we think that that was probably really important to you. Lord, we commit ourselves to you. Thank you for the gifts, the diverse gifts that we have seen and expressed in our church body. And help us come together as one always as we follow you. And as we do, the whole community will watch and see the miracle of people working together under you as the head. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Thank you, George. All righty.